Jay just mentioned, the ideology called Torah of Mada is associated with Yeshiva University or YU, which brings my mind back to 1986, which was YU's uh, centennial year. And in one of the student Purim uh, newspapers, they put up a mock ad by Satmar. And what it said is, congratulations, Yeshiva University, on your 100th birthday. Admeya the Esrim. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, when I drafted this um, uh, uh, paper, what I wanted to do is to have a little bit of sociology, a brief sociology, amateur sociology, followed by some sort of uh, addressing of an issue that's come up at this conference, which is historiography, or the writing of history. So I, I started to uh, draft it, and then that called to mind the uh, fellow, the German author, who published his mag was publishing his magnum opus, and he finished 11 volumes, and he died before he got to the verb. <laughs> no German will get that. Uh, anyway, I will give you uh, a mix of sociology on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, something a bit more uh, philosophical. Torah Mada is the ideology that insists that Jews should pursue general culture and general education, not just for reasons of parnasa, or is not just to earn money, but because to make a living, but because culture has a religious worth. The worth could be understanding God's world, interpreting Torah, refining character, enhancing psak, deepening one's spirituality, curing disease, realizing one's self, and securing justice. The idea here, of course, refers to high culture, you know, the, the uh, highfalutin culture, as opposed to, let's say, Seinfeld and Spider-Man, though I think that Toto Mado ought to try to develop a theory of popular culture as well. Now, it's called the Haredi position, at least in America, the definitions may, may differ from here to Israel, it is one of, two, one of two things. Either that one is not allowed to pursue general studies and one is not allowed to work, or that one is allowed to pursue general studies for the sake of uh, ultimately earning a living. Now, there is a very deep paradox about Torah Umada. And the paradox is this, that Mada, the use of Mada, is very much in evidence, even among those who fiercely deny Torah Umada. Example, Yoel Finkelman, who is a uh, sociologist, philosopher at bar Ilan and at Atid, um, has, is, is publishing a book about books that are published by Haredi Presses. The books are about marriage, parenting, self-esteem, and of course nutrition, Jews, favorite subject of Jews. Um, now actually, I tell uh, audiences sometimes that, that when I have to uh, cite Kierkegaard, I always refer to him, uh, refer to his nationality, he was from Denmark, and I explain to them the reason is that usually when you say the name Kierkegaard to an audience, it's like, it's in schluff. But you say the word Danish to a Jewish audience, you get totally different results. Um, anyway, uh, Professor Finkelman shows that uh, these books draw from secular work on these topics of marriage, parenting, self-esteem, and nutrition. But they do two things. First of all, they mask the origins of, of, these, of, of, their, of the ideas. Secondly, they sequester the conflicts. That is, they hide the fact that there may be conflicts. An example of this is spanking a child, hitting a child which is not only licensed but mandated in many halakhic sources, and yet all of a sudden we're told in these books that the Torah way is not to spank a child. Likewise, the Torah way is to have self-esteem, when in truth we have a long tradition that says that one ought to uh, abate, engage in self-abasement. Certain aspects of marriage he shows are different and so forth. Besides this, it was all has been said for a very long time, that in areas like technology and medicine, um, that it, well, these are, in Rabbi Norman Lamb's phrase, battering rams of modernity. That is, you cannot escape technology, you cannot escape using medicine. And the question comes up, of course, of how you can have a state without professionals of, ev of every kind. And of course, on top of that, if medicine and technology work, then there's got to be something right about scientific method which undercuts the certain skepticism about science that you often find on the Haredi side. I also personally have uh, some wondering about this, quite about this idea of, that it's legitimate to uh, pursue secular studies only for Parnassa. There are many um, MDs, like mental health professionals, among the Haredi. These are extraordinarily dedicated professionals. 
I would be very disappointed if I asked them, why did you go into medicine? And they say, it's because I wanted to make money. I'd rather that they say, I want to save lives. But the ideology kind of precludes that as being a justification. And what kind of indictment is it of a community when its doctors have to give you that answer? Um, now, of course, these kinds of things that I'm talking about, well, I can go on. There was an issue of the Jewish Observer. The Jewish Observer is published by Agudath Israel. It is, which represents in America the sort of the, the Haredi <coughs> journal. Uh, they allow secular studies only for Parnassah. There was an issue published uh, some years ago with the on, cover, on the cover, and this is very, very much to the credit that they tackled the issue. Um, it said, secular studies, a neglected frontier. And what they dealt with was the following question. You know, in our ideology, secular studies are, in, uh, are far, far inferior. In fact, they're basically, uh, uh, you know, inherently worthless. In that case, what are we going to do in the classroom? The students don't take the, the course, the classes seriously. They exhibit a tremendous lack of deference toward the teachers. And so what the issue did was to try to reverse that by saying, for example, this is practically a direct quote from the introduction to the issue, the students have to learn that they have to behave the same way at 4 p.m., that is in the Limud de Chol, as they do at 9 a.m., that is in the Limud de Kodesh. And one of the articles there gives reasons for pursuing secular studies that are virtually identical with reasons that are given in Dr. Lamb's book. Now, what I've described is not yet really Torah Umada in the sense that there has been no, no discussion of philosophy, literature, and the arts. Uh, I would actually say that music is another area where there is a clear drawing of Mada. You hear a lot of the from music today, much of it, both the tunes, the beats, the arrangements, are drawn from, uh, from, from the secular world. Um, a, a, friend of, a friend of mine from long ago, Vel Pasternak, who was one of the um, famous compilers of Jewish music, he reports that he was at a wedding and they started to sing a nigan. The nigan was, yeah, bye, 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 bye. So he said to them, do you know what this is? This is the French national anthem. And somebody said, where do you think they got it from? <laughs> okay. Also, I would say that there's a difference between using manda and having Torah. And at the same, and yet, and, and there's a difference between that and having Torah umada. So I don't want to quite say the way I've described so far as Torah Uma, that it's some sort of a combination or integration of the two, but I think it certainly suggests a much more positive evaluation of Mada than you normally get in the anti-Torah Mada ideology. What's less often noted, I think, than, than what I've described so far, is the ways in which academic Jewish studies have made significant inroads into the larger Orthodox community. There's been a kind of incursion into the Orthodox camp, especially history, okay, to a large extent Bible. Uh, in America, philosophy, I'm sad to say, very little. In fact, Rabbi Walt de Wurzberg, or Oliver Shalom, used to say it's a shame people misread the Pusuk. They, the Pusuk says, Mechashefa lo sechayeh. They think it says, Machashova lo sechayeh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that the crucial cause of, of this sort of widening of, uh, of academic Jewish studies towards the larger community has to do with what I would call the democratization of scholarship. It's a democratization that has been brought about by an increase in modern Orthodox scholarly journals and modern Orthodox blogs, for example, Svarim and Hirurim. As far as journals, normally scholarly journals go to a restricted audience of academics. But the major journals in the Orthodox community, tradition, the Torah Mada Journal, you may have heard of that because Danny mentioned it about two minutes ago. Orot, which is formerly the Eta Journal. Chakira, if you haven't seen it, check it out. BDD, published by Barry Lan. Jewish Action, which sometimes does publish scholarly articles. And, and, and of course, throw it from here, something like Abdomos. Their subscribers are mostly not academics. And so the result is that academic goods are being brought to the wider community. Now, you can have one of two types of, of uh, results from this. One result is, look, this is a potentially volatile enterprise, and you can have some hostile reactions. I mean, Mark Shapiro experienced this in the early 1990s when he published his original article about Ikorib. It's certainly an illustration of the potential for volatility. But on the other hand, there's a second tendency that I see, 
And that is a much wider and a better appreciation of how hard it is to get away with disingenuous, fabricated, or sincere but carelessly researched assertions. Years ago, Rabbi Jacob J. Schachter published uh, an article arguing that contrary to common wisdom, the Nitziv, Rav Antoni Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the head of the Vlazhin Yeshiva, did not close the doors of the Vlazhin because he did not want it to be secular studies. As I recall, and my recollection here may be wrong, Rabbi Schechter couldn't verify it, the Jewish observer, well, you know, who cares? <laughs> the Jewish observer had a, no, who's going to check? The Jewish observer had a little piece on something or other in which they said, as if there was no shift, that in 1892, the yeshiva of the Lushen closed, period. And Rabbi Schechter's 100-page article in 1998 in the Torah Hamada Journal, exposing distortions of history, um, actually got a yashukoa from the people being criticized. And I think that what it brought out was the need for really, you know, the kind of research that scholars do if one was going to establish a claim, if it was going to establish a claim. The episode was actually, I think, an object lesson in how to discover historical truths. And I don't know how many of those refuted claims come up anymore. Um, academic books by scholarly presses reach a broad public thanks to blogs which talk about them, which have links to them. Um, and it, although one scholar said that uh, uh, blogs put scholars at the mercy, this is an eminent scholar talking, put blogs at the mercy of anyone who can type. Um, <laughs> despite that, I think by and large it's been very positive in circulating scholarship. Another reason that scholars are known to the public has to do with a very nice little uh, enterprise we have in the States called Scholar in Residence Weekends, where we go for Shabbos or Yantif to a shul, we get a nice check, see everybody's ears are perking up here, um, and for many shuls, scholars in residence are a must in adult education. The result really of this and other factors is a much more educated uh, Orthodox public. And I think that the strongest manifestation of this democratization of scholarship is that lay people publish, not only in the Orthodox journals, but in general scholarly venues. So for example, a physician named uh, Jeremy Brown will soon be publishing with Oxford University Press a meticulously researched book on Jewish responses to the Copernican Revolution. I think as a result of the scholarship reaching these audiences, there has also been a bit of broadening or a greater comfort level with certain ideas that are kind of standard in academic scholarship. For example, people are more comfortable with the idea of um, academic modes of Talmud study, with history of, of halacha, and with other sorts of ideas that come out in scholarship. And I'll just mention here that Mark and I were talking last night the reaction to his book on the Ikarim, in contrast to the reaction to the article, we're getting this right, you know, has actually been a, a very receptive and favorable one, and he gets contacts from Haridim, right, to actually show an appreciation, an appreciation of the book. So things, things have changed as far as this uh, activity of bringing scholarly work out to the general community. Now, how much time do I have? Okay. I think the strides have been sufficiently uh, significant that maybe we ought to look at some issues that have not, so far as I know, uh, been explored. I believe that there are certain stresses, tensions, anomalies, paradoxes, internal pressures, where is that the source? Internal pressures within modern Orthodox scholarship. Um, and in the published version of this paper, I hope to, discover, to discuss several items that are on my mind. In this setting, I offer elaboration on one or two. Uh, the question really is going to pertain to the writing of history, and as a philosopher, I am therefore wide open to the objection that I'm talking about a field that is outside of my expertise. So I say to myself, well, you know, often it's precisely the outsider who identifies and questions presuppositions that insiders take as axiomatic. Then I say to myself that often the outsider makes a fool of himself. Well, let's see what happens. Years ago, Rabbi Shimon Schwab, the leader of the German Orthodox community, proposed that a community is perfectly justified in writing about the past, not for purposes of generating an accurate history of personalities and events, but for the sake of inspiration, even if that means loss of completeness and truth. 
Quote, what ethical purpose is served by preserving a realistic historical picture? Nothing but the satisfaction of curiosity. Shame and Yefes covered Noah's nakedness so they could always remember their father as a tzaddik. Now, Rav Schwab's position is not the typical Haredi position in terms of to writing history. I mean, normally the thought is that we are writing accurate history. But I do believe that to the extent that we find the writing of inaccurate history problematic, we ought to look at least at a version of that practice that comes with a justification attached. So I'd like to look a little more closely at the reactions to Rabbi Schwab's argument. Now, I didn't see a lot published on this. Rabbi Schechter mentioned one thing very briefly, but I did hear, talk to a number of people. And they thought that uh, this assertion must be vigorously rebuffed, uh, that it shows intellectual dishonesty. They said that history must trump memory, to use uh, the, the, the contrast that's very popular today, and that accuracy must override inspiration. Now, notice, first of all, that the people who are at the conference, I guess, uh, can appreciate this the most, um, is that this is a case where a, a group within orthodoxy is using history to validate itself. History, which has been problematic in other ways to orthodoxy, and this, this has come up at the conference, is being used within orthodoxy to validate one group of the orthodox uh, as opposed to the other. Secondly, the, this response of belittling Rabbi Schwab's argument uh, is, I think, quite un Maimonidean. Maimonides drew a distinction between true beliefs and useful beliefs, um, and for him, the social implications or consequences of broadcasting the truth is something that needs to be taken into account, whereas in the response that I got, it was ignored. But there's a much deeper irony here. Consider the modern orthodox approach to Midrash. Modern orthodox Jews are insistent that Agadot should not be interpreted literally. Instead, the Agadot mean to impart moral lessons and inspiration. Many or most Agadot are not meant as literal truths, and the right is derided from literalism. In other words, modern Orthodox people I spoke to were condemning Rav Schwab for advocating a genre of storytelling whose aim is to inspire rather than record, and yet they then fault the right for not realizing that this very genre was practiced by the sages. It is true that Rav Schwab could have said that his community should clearly announce that their writing is misleading or romanticized. But then again, Chazal did not announce that the Agatot are not to be taken literally, which is the omission that makes literalism an option to begin with. As we move to Tanakh, or at least Chomish, we see the same pattern. Modern Orthodox chastise the right for resisting a non-literal interpretation of the opening two or three chapters of Genesis. Don't worry, the modern Orthodox will come out all right when I'm all done. Going to lengths to cite authorities who say that the Bible, or those parts of the Bible, are not meant as history. Mark alluded to the Slifkin affair. Instead, they are meant as inspiration or moral enlightenment. Then we turn around and reject Rav Schwab for advocating a continuation and a resurrection of this genre. Now, the right wing is in exactly the same boat. They take Medrash and Genesis 1 literally. But when it comes to contemporary figures, the position gets reversed. And suddenly, the genre of inspiration takes over, and they can't conceive that the Medrash might be writing history like they, being they that is generalizing from Rav Schwab, they are writing a history, namely for the sake of inspiration. So in both cases, you have a rupture with Medrash, with, the, with Chazal. The modern Orthodox are writing history in a way that's contrary to their view of Medrash, and the right wing are writing history, contemporary history, in a way that's contrary to their view of Medrash. Now, whatever problems exist in the coherence of the right-wing view, the fact that the plague is on both houses hardly excuses the modern Orthodox community from addressing its own inconsistency and making its own view coherent. And um, some people have said to me, well, look, the difference is this, that the right-wing uh, history, the Medrash sought to convey the complexity of human beings and their vulnerability, and that, for example, a Talmudic story about a man who visited uh, every prostitute, uh, referring to later, um, uh, or 
Gemaras that tell stories about rabbis with powerful Yetzirahs. Those are a far cry from hagiographies, that is the kind of writing you have about the pious rabbis. It's a far cry, that's been said, from simplification, reduction, and homogenization of personalities. But I don't see how this really is going to get out of a problem. In fact, I think it creates a new problem. Because, according to this logic, it would be perfectly okay for a modern Orthodox historian to take a real sage and invent some story about him that would talk about the, 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 uh, uh, the scope of his Yetzirah. Obviously, we don't do that today. So it just becomes another instance of our writing history in a way different than they did. Now, so Hadra Kushya Leduchte, and both sides need to yield something, perhaps, to the other. However, there is, um, I think, a possible answer here that will cover some cases. Um, David Berger pointed out at a previous Ben-Gurion conference that there's one type of inaccurate historiography that even the right should rule out. Namely, making up a story or suppressing truth about a Godel's pronouncements or behavior in order to, that is, you make it up, in order to vindicate one's own ideological position. You can hardly say that you were following Rabbi X when you knowingly have used a distorted version of Rabbi X's pronouncements or actions. Now, there are two or three sources that say, you know, that you can do that. The only reason I mention that is if you find out later that I knew, but that I didn't mention it, I have a lot of explaining to do. But in those sorts of cases, I think that inspirational historiography would clearly be out of court because you're, you're misrepresenting someone's halakhic position. But those cases are only a subset of the total number of cases of falsification. And so we are really back to the question of how is it that we, modern Orthodox uh, historians, would have a different approach to writing history than Chazal. Now here I think perhaps one could say, how much time do I have there? Seven. Okay. Um, one could say that, in fact one has to say I think, that ultimately there is some kind of a gap in the value judgment or the sensibility between the sages and modern historiography. And then modern orthodox historian can continue as follows. I opt for modern historiography. Well, am I thereby saying that the sages were inferior to us? Well, no, because it might be said that at the time of Chazal, there was no modern historiography. So they weren't making a value claim when they inspired, when they adopted the inspirational model. But today, Rav Schwab is picking between two models, the modern historiographic model and the inspirational model, and he is making a choice that doesn't necessarily follow from what Chazal did, because Chazal did not have an alternative. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful, and I don't know whether it's going to resolve the kind of basic uh, discomfort about the bottom line. Which is a better way of writing? Is it better to have a huge body of literature like Medrash, which is there for inspirational or historical, rather than sort of straightforwardly historical purposes, or is it better to have something in the spirit of modern historiography? Ironically, since the publication of, in 1982, uh, the great historian Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi Zal published a book called Zachar, which set off a huge discussion. And he spoke about the difference between history, that is, producing narratives that are based upon the kinds of objective evidence that historians use, and on the other hand, what's called memory which is, represents a kind of a filter through which events are, um, uh, are, are siphoned. Uh, Chaim Soloveitchik describes it as follows. Um, it, he's describing the right-wing uh, writing. Historiography weaves features, this kind of historiography, there's memory, weaves features and values of the present with real and supposed events of the past. In other words, it's a kind of mix of fact and fiction. What's been happening since the publication of Yerushalmi's book is that there has been what is called what has been called a memory boom. That is to say that the the uh, school that says that we can write memory is becoming far stronger than it was before. So ironically, the right wing way of doing things could actually be more modern, that is, and up to date, than the 
modern orthodox way of doing it, though I don't think we have reached that point. The, the final question that I would like to uh, consider is this. How much time now? Four? Five. Okay. <laughs> Once I was in a, I was in a shul and the rabbi was going around the pack and he held up five fingers, so I just held up five fingers and didn't land either. Okay. The last uh, question I want to ask is sort of uh, why should we care? Or why should we, that is to say, why should we care about convincing other people about history? Well, to some extent it seems like a you know stupid question, but let me explain to you uh, what, what I mean. If I have a neighbor and my neighbor believes that the world is 5,770 years old, or he believes that God arranged for the Yankees to win the World Series last year, which is what I believe, uh, <laughs> or that God helped him, or that God helped him find the parking space. Uh, there's a joke about a guy who was circling around for a space, and he calls up to the heavens and says, "Please, God, grant me a parking space." Just then his face opens, the guy said, never mind, I found one. <laughs> I told that joke to an audience once, and nobody laughed, even though everywhere else people laughed. Turns out the rabbi had told it the previous week. Now, who did the rabbi hear it from? He heard it from me, because I was been addressing a group of rabbis, and I told this joke. So, more, so what happens is, you talk, if you, it's a terrible idea to tell jokes to groups of rabbis, because then they go back and look to the shul. Then when you're invited as a scholar in residence, it doesn't work out at all. Okay. Now, so I don't really care whether my neighbor believes, believes in those sorts of things that I actually don't believe in. But I do very much care if people try to claim that Rabbi X said Y or did Z when he really didn't. And the reason for wanting to get others over, the reason I want to convince people of that, because ultimately I am concerned about distortions of tradition. The point of raising the history distortions in public ways is not so much to correct people's beliefs about a certain position. It's not to correct, at least the way I view it, not to correct the belief about evolution, not to correct the belief about providence, but to correct what could be called a meta-belief. That is, the belief that this is the only belief that is sanctioned by, by, our, um, by our authority. So, to sum up, one, MAGA has made, made inroads into the Haredi community in the form of self-help guides and the form of medicine and technology, but more importantly, in the form of a greater acceptance of academic assertions and, in general, a greater interest in scholarly work. Point number two, that in the case of history, both the modern, modern Orthodox and the right wing show a measure of inconsistency when you look at their approaches to Medrash and Chumash as compared to their approaches to writing contemporary history. Three, that ironically, at this moment, the right wing could make itself more accepting of, or rather, maybe I should say, you know, could actually exploit contemporary trends, namely the rise of memory as a legitimate way of grounding history. And number four, my point is, it's okay to hock a Chinook if you hock about the right things. And I close uh, with the story of the speaker who was going on a little too long, and he saw that the audience began to fidget, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have a watch. And somebody yelled out, no, but there's a calendar behind you. <laughs> Thank you very much.